And today my discussion will be confined to the topic that was chosen for me between two worlds. What do you think the two worlds, how do you perceive that? And one brother said, you know, dunya versus akhirah. You know, the worldly life compared to the grandeur of the next life. Another brother, he said, no, no, it's the dunya, but the struggle to not go too far in this worldly life that you ruin the next life. And another one, he said, no, it's, you know, the dunya, it's not just about this life, but it's about what you want and your ambition in it, and not to lose other aspects that are also important. And the overall arching theme is the quest for success. And I want to begin with Surah Al-Fatiha. And I want you to kind of think about the gravity of why it is the opening chapter of Islam. See, the Book of Allah, the Quran, which is the source for us as Muslims, as the stepping stone, the cornerstone of all success. So whenever you and I want to measure success, and success is something metric, you can measure it. How successful are you financially? I can measure. What do you have in your bank account? What kind of car do you drive? What's your postcode? It's measurable. How successful are you academically? What are your credentials? What are your qualifications? And not just what they are, but where did you earn them? Which university rather than which? But one of the things that is not measurable is the effect of success in your life. And there's many people who have and live between those two worlds. And that's where I want to confine my discussion the pursuit of this worldly success, but not at losing the contentment of heart and satisfaction of love and family. Allah begins the Quran as a kitab. You know, the concept of a book is a very sacred concept for us as Muslims. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there wasn't one volume. There wasn't one mushaf where all of the Quran was in one place. Every verse was written, gathered and collected in the hearts of people and on leaf, on bark, on deer skin, on many places. But it wasn't kitab in the concept of kitab you and I have as one volume. But it had a coherence. And the coherence is not chronological. The Quran, unlike the Bible, does not begin in the beginning and end at the end. The Quran begins with Al-Fatiha, the opening. And you begin with the name of God. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And you acknowledge Allah as the Lord of mercy, the giver of all mercy, who is especially merciful to those who distinguish themselves. There's an excelling, cascading effect of mercy that you have between you and Allah that you can attain. Alhamdulillah. I'm thankful to the opportunity to be able to worship you and recognize you. An opportunity that many are denied. And of the greatest ni'mah, of the greatest blessings, graces, and the concept of ni'mah is something you are given that you haven't earned. You didn't do anything really to earn it. Had you not been given faith and led to it, you would not have come to it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our hidayah and of our children and children's children. Allahumma ameen. So you praise the Almighty. Alhamdulillah. The Lord of all existence. Because he is a Rahman, a Rahim. You know that word a Rahman, it's the only name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's used unilaterally. All of the other names and attributes of Allah are used in combination. Al Hayyul Qayyum, Malik al Mulk, Dhul Jalali wal Ikram. But that word a Rahman is the only one that on its own is meaningful. That whether you invoke Allah as Allah in all of his might or you single out the conceptualization in your heart that He is the giver, the Lord of all mercy. Whichever name you choose of Him, you will find Him the one who answers those who turn to Him in invocation. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm din I recognize that your mercy in this life must be thanked. And I understand that on the day of judgment, I'll stand before you and be questioned about my existence and my being, my life. Qulinna salati. وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ The same word, the Lord of all existence. To Him alone is my 
devotions and prayers, my sacrifice, my whole existence and my life and death for Him alone, the Lord of all existence. And you come to that recognition that He is the Malik, the dominant on the day of judgment, the one you are accountable to for the little and the small. Take possession of your book. You'll be enough sufficient of a judge for or against yourself on that day. So it's at that moment in my prayer, in your prayer, 17 times a day, I begin to ask Allah for something. And I want to sign a contract after recognizing the one I'm obligated to. I ask for my first request. Ihdina. Lead all of us. Look at the wording. It's not Ihdini. Every other aspect of this surah is very personal. You and Allah. Alhamdulillah. I acknowledge God. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, I, unilaterally, me, myself. But then you come and ask for something that you want to give universal as a value. Ihdina, not Ihdini. All of us, everyone I've met and haven't met. Those who are near and those who are far. Those who hear and those who can't. Those who read and those who are unlettered. Ihdina. Lead all of us to a straight path. A path between two worlds. Subhanallah. A path that isn't innovated and new. It doesn't go up and down and left and right. It's a path that leads you if you follow it, if you put your step where he stepped, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It will lead you to where your destination is. But recognize that where he stepped was not a new step. He stepped where Abraham stepped. And he stepped where Moses stepped. And he stepped where Adam stepped. And therefore you say, God, O oh Allah Almighty, lead me to a path that others who were favored before me followed. Not a path that has been tread upon by those who angered you. You know that word, مغضوب عليهم, those who earned your anger, those who you showed your wrath to, in this life and in the next life. Who are those who anger Allah? They are those who know the path and choose to walk off it. They say, I know this is the path, but I'm going that way. And no one will tell me how to live my life but me. I'm not a submitter. I'm not a surrenderer, which is the correct meaning and translation of the word Islam. Many people find it difficult. Really? Fasting? You know, I have non-Muslim friends that say, so by being hungry, that's going to give you peace? By waking up every day before the sun rises, five in the morning, four in the morning in the summer, that gives you peace? Doesn't that make you grumpy and tired? By giving from your wealth that you worked so hard to earn and you're making ends meet and you share it with others, that's going to give you peace? Oh Allah, don't close our heart and our sight to the path that makes us angry, angering to you. The other world is not just simply that you anger God because you know what you should do, but the other path is that you don't seek misguidance, dalal, is that you don't know which way you're going. But even though I know I don't know where I'm going, and I know who I should ask to find the direction, I intentionally go it alone. I intentionally go blind to the signs of God, to what my heart recognizes as, as truth. That my heart tells me, this is where you should be. These are the people you should be with. Everything indicates to a truth and a submission to God. But I say, if I know that I'm obligated, I'd rather be dumb, deaf, and blind. So their mind is of no value. Allah doesn't say that their eyes are blind. But the heart is darkened to such a degree that it purposefully chooses to become unaware of its relationship with its Lord Almighty. And the moment you make that dua, you and those who hear it from you say, Ameen. Which means, oh my Lord, give me what he asked. Even if I didn't speak those words and you're standing behind me in salah and I recite it aloud, you say, Ameen. Oh Allah, I didn't read it, but give me what that man asked for. It is the most comprehensive seven verses, as sab al-mathani. 
Al Imam Ibn Al Qayyim he says that all of Islam is the Quran. And everything in the Quran is that opening chapter of Al Fatiha. And everything in that chapter is that one ayah, Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'in. So if you were genuine and you were truly of those who ask Allah for that success, to be guided to a path that you won't discover unless He turns your heart to it, unless you seek to be from those who limit your anger of Allah and those who seek to have an enlightenment that you know you can find and need to search for, that requires effort and energy. Allah says, you want it? Turn the page. Alif la meem, with these letters. SubhanAllah. You know, a lot of people that try to shake faith, they'll come and they'll say, do you know everything that's in the Quran? I say to you that there is no human being on the surface of the earth who can say to you, I know the minute details of the Quran. Ask them, Alif, Lam, Mim, or Kaf, Ha, Ya, Ain, Sad. What does it mean? All of the Sahaba had different opinions. Could you imagine if I walked in a church as a pastor? And I stood in front of the congregation and I began by saying, X, Q, B, Y, C. I'm reading to you the word of God. They'd be like, this man has lost his mind. What do you mean the word of God? And you as a Muslim, you have no problem with that. These jointed letters are letters that are confined in the speech of God. That the Quran to us is not just the meaning of the word of God. See, if I ask our cousins in faith, if I come to a pastor and I say, Reverend, did God say in the beginning to begin the Bible, to begin the Torah? He'll say, no, that's the writing of man giving you the meaning, the intent of the message of God. So the Bible is God's word in meaning, but not literal. And I say, well, that's a difference between you and I. I actually, as a Muslim, I believe that the letter, kaf, is from God, sent. And because I don't know it, there's many other things that I don't know in the Quran, and I'm comfortable with my faith that I don't need to know every single detail about it. So Allah begins, alif, with these letters, I'm going to give you this final scripture. It will make up a book. You will find in it no contradiction. And one that is not open for you to question if you seek its blessing. لا ريب في don't approach it with an insincerity of heart. Don't approach it, approach it with fact finding, with mistake finding. Don't approach it where your intent is, I'm gonna disprove it. Approach it with a piety of heart where you seek to read it in its entirety, understand its coherence. You will then find it is a guidance, but not for everyone. Hudan exclusively lil muttaqin to those who come to it with a piety of heart in surah qaf allah makes it even clear inna hadha la this book it is the reminder that mankind needs meaning it's things you already know that has been sent to people who came before you it's things that your fitra your natural inclination and human disposition calls you to it is a dhikr لِمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ قَلْ For the one who possesses a heart. SubhanAllah. The first condition for you to benefit from the word of God is that you need a heart that's alive. You need a compassionate heart. One that wants to know and care and feel for yourself and others. لِمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ قَلْ For the one who searched for their heart and gives it their full hearing, full attention. وَهُوَ شَهِيدٌ And they come to it hoping to bear witness to its trueness. And therefore you find that what galvanizes faith 
is not just simply the word of God, but the preparedness for you to surrender yourself to the will of Allah. And therefore we exist between two worlds. A world at times, and for Muslims and non-Muslims, that seeks to lure us away from the word of God. Not just the scripture that Muslims have, but the very essence and principles, what we refer to as qiyam, that are of the Judeo-Christian doctrine and the doctrines that are unanimously agreed to as universal values. Today you find a world where the very underpinnings of what is moral is shifting and changing. Where there's a cloudiness and a murkiness between what is ethical and what is not. Where it's okay to speak half-truths, to represent one side and not the other. Where it's okay to prejudice and prejudge and stereotype. Where it's okay to characterize and hold accountable a person who has nothing to do with the crimes of others. The Quran commands, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ That our Quran calls us to that which is best in all things. The summary of the ayah is Allah wants you not to do what's right, but to do the best of what is right. That's a very strange concept in the type of world that we live in today. It's something you don't see. It's not just I'm going to do what's right. Well, that's right. You know, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do the least of what's right. Well, I didn't lie. I didn't cheat. I didn't take it all. I didn't eat it all. I didn't move. I didn't. In fact, your faith compels you to do the best of what is right. And it asks you not just to stay away from what's wrong, but to stay as far away as you can from what is wrong to be as transparent, as clear, and as abhorrent as whatever it is you find is something that is sinful practice, to be as clear of it as you can. I'm going to leave you with one final verse from the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tilka darul akhirah. That worldly next life, the life that we all seek, you know, that place in paradise, Allah says, I have dedicated it, prepared it for those who do not seek ascendancy in this life alone. If your only claim to happiness, if your only claim to success is material, is temporal, is in the here and now, if your only success is in the things that you can hold, things that you can make use of, and you haven't had savings for that which is beyond this life, know that there's an imbalance. And you've preferred one life over the next. Not just that they don't want to have supremacy in this earth, but they don't want to cause any trouble and havoc for others. Live with this maxim of our law. I want to leave this life, you, your aim to leave this life where nobody owes you anything. And more importantly, that you owe nobody anything. That you leave a, a soft footprint. That not even a tree has been cut down unnecessarily by you. One of my teachers in Al Medina, I remember we were eating, and the last few scraps of breadcrumbs, you know, you break bread on a table and there's a few breadcrumbs, he would take out his handkerchief and he would pull them into that little handkerchief. And I thought, that's a very strange thing to do. I said to him, Sheikh, what are you doing? He said, Sadaqa, it's a charity. I'm like, charity? Who are you, you going to feed breadcrumbs to? And then I noticed as we were walking, he would take out discreetly and just empty it out on the ground where he saw ants or little, you know, insects that were roaming. It was his act of charity, even in that compassion. That's the ideal of a Muslim. That's the heart of someone who submitted their affair to Allah, who understands that Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest.